Hello everybody, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. We're live and it's Hidden Treasures Season 2. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This is the live show in which we take you behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum here in London. And as always, I'm your host, Connor. Now, today we are in the museum's conservation lab. And this is a super amazing place in which the museum's expert preparators and scientists maintain upkeep and clean all of the specimens that the museum looks after in its collection. Uh, now, if you've seen this show before, you'll know the format. If not, it's really simple. We're here and we're live for the next 30 minutes. Um, and we're here to look at whatever you want to see. So you'll see I'm surrounded by some really, really cool specimens and equipment. So if you have any questions about anything, you want to see anything up close, make sure you pop that in the live chat box if you're watching live and we'll come to as many as we have time for. I've got my phone on me, so I'm keeping track of everything that comes through. And also, every week, we are joined by a museum expert scientist. So this time, we're joined by Kieran Miles, who's actually just working over there, who's a paleontologist and the fossil preparator here at the museum. So if you have questions for Kieran as well, make sure you pop those in the chat box. Um, and make sure you stick around to the end of the episode where you'll get a hint of where we're heading in next week's episode. Remember, with season two of Hidden Treasures, we're coming to you live every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. BST. So we'll be live next Tuesday as well. So make sure you stick around to the end to find out where we're heading. But for now, I think we should get started and go and meet Kieran. So if you want to follow me. So hello there, Kieran. Connor, how's it going? Yeah, not bad. How are you doing? All right, thanks. Thanks so much for having us down here. So you're very busy. There's lots of stuff in your workspace. Yeah. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask, really, what is a fossil preparator? What do you do? Yeah, it's a good question, because it's quite an unusual job. A uh, fossil preparator, um, when you find a fossil, it's typically buried in rock, it's covered in rock, and you need to uh, excavate it, maybe from the field, you know, bring out a block containing, say, fossil bones or preserved uh, animal remains or plant remains. And uh, you don't really want to extract those right there in the field, or you might not be able to. So we carve out, carve out blocks of rock, mm. maybe wrap them up in plaster of Paris and bandages and things to protect them, and ship them back to the museum. And down in the lab here, the fossil preparator would carefully remove that rock using whatever tools or techniques they think is most appropriate to reveal those fossils, either so they can be better researched uh, or for display purposes. Right, OK. So, I mean, where yeah, as I've said already, we're surrounded by really cool things. But there's one thing in, sp in particular that is a mystery specimen. Do you want to point out the mystery specimen sure. so we can get a look at that? I've laid out your mystery specimen okay, just great. here. So as always with Hidden Treasures, we have revealed our mystery specimen to our YouTube community ahead of the show. Uh, and make sure if you're watching on live to send through your thoughts on what this could be and we'll reveal with Kieran at the end of the show. But Kieran, we've actually already had a few guesses through. Excellent. Um, so we've had some fantastic guesses already. Someone thinks this could be a turtle fin. That's a great suggestion. Which is really, really cool. It's a shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a big flipper maybe. Um, also someone suggests it could be a triceratops plate. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could be, we've also had another guess, it could be a stegosaurus fin. Like one of the plates on the back? Yeah, yeah very, potentially. Very clever, yeah. Um, and yeah, lots of, lots of suggestions around dinosaurs, ceratopsians in particular, I'm seeing that word a lot. What is a ceratopsian? A ceratopsian is the group of dinosaurs that typically have horns on their face, sometimes a big sort of head shield. Uh, things like that. Great. So like a triceratops. Like triceratops, protoceratops, things okay. like that. Excellent. Right, so we'll come back to more of those guesses later, but keep them coming through. And as you can hear, Kieran is an expert paleontologist. So if you have questions for Kieran, please send those through as well. Um, but uh, until then, uh, I wanted to kind of ask as well, um, why is it that we need fossil preparators? Obviously, things coming out of the ground, um, I mean... What do they kind of look like when they come out? <laughs> well, yeah, when they come out, they tend to be um, stuck in rocks. They're, they're, you might find a chunk of rock with just, just a few fragments of bone just showing through. And um, it takes a really, really long time to reveal that information that the researchers need. They, if they need to study uh, the specimen, they can't right. see it until the preparator's got to work and dug away that work. And that could be days, could be weeks, could be months, could be years of wow. work. To reveal that fossil. So I imagine you have quite a lot of work to get through down here. <laughs> There's nine million fossils in the collection. There's one fossil preparator at the museum. The fossils are winning. 
Uh, I'm very, very busy and I have a lot on. <laughs> so what are your tools of the trade? How do you do this? Yeah, that's a good question. Let me so bring you over to my yes, working area. That would be great. So there's all kinds of tools and techniques I can use. It will vary depending on what kind of rock the fossils are in, what, right. what the fossils are made of even. So if they're very tiny things, I might be working under a microscope with a pin vise. Oh, it's wow. like a, a carbide steel pin. And I'll be literally scratching away grain by grain under the microscope with wow. a pin vise like I that. I bet you'd need a real kind of like steady hand to yeah. work with that. That um, looks really delicate. Manual dexterity, I'd say, is one of the top things you need to be a fossil preparator. <laughs> that and a lot of patience. Okay. And also creative problem solving. Um, right. To solve problems as they come up. Uh, and yeah, I'll be puffing away the rock as it's... Uh, coming through. Oh, okay. Um, Why are you puffing away? What's that for? To, to bl blow away the uh, grains of rock that might be obscuring okay. the fossil as it's coming through. You've got through. nice clear workspace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I use a lot of hand tools. This is what we call mechanical preparation. Right. This is uh, preparation by hand tools, basically. So as well as sort of dental tools, scalpels, oh. picks and things like that, <laughs> I also use a lot of air tools. So okay. one of the most versatile and useful tools in the fossil preparator kit is the air pen or air scribe. Mm. And that's like a miniature pneumatic drill. Yeah. So when you switch that on and connect it to the compressed air, that tip, which is tungsten carbide, so it's harder than most rocks, will vibrate up and down thousands of times a second and you use that to chisel away really hard rock. Yeah. Um, Do you mind if I show that to the sure. camera, actually? So you can get a nice close look at that. So there, you've got a selection of these, don't you? Different sizes for different types yeah, of Yeah, yeah, different tips, different heads. You know, this big, chunky, sturdy chisel head like that for hard rock or right. might be a finer, finer tip for uh, more delicate rocks. Okay, excellent. And the one we've got here is like a bit of a, a middle of the road kind yeah, of size. Yeah, yeah, very standard. Um, that's one of the most useful tools in the kit. Lots of my tools are what we call pneum pneumatic air powered. Mm. So I've got compressed air running through the lab and my air scribes or air pens will run off those. We also got an air abrader, which is like, um, wow. it's basically a miniaturized sand blaster. You top it up with which, whatever powder you want to use. Yes. So different mineral powders, different hardnesses. Um, and you'll blast them away, a mix of air and powder will blast through the nozzle. And you use that to jet away the rock. Very, very good for delicate, fine detail work, the air abrasive. Right, okay. Um, they've also <laughs> got rotary tools, so okay. uh, mechanical, um, electrical tools that spin and were, you know, like um, various dental tools like this with interchangeable heads, depending on whether you want a, a sort of grinding head or a slicing head. Wow. Uh, cutting away different um, types of rock or wearing them down. And um, we've got, we've actually had a couple of questions through already. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to, I think it would be really good to get to see you at work. Right. But before we get to those, I've got a couple of questions. So, um, we, we actually had a question come in quite early in about what types of fossils do we have, what are you working on at the moment? Do you mind if we kind of go back sure. over there and have yeah, a little yeah, look yeah. at those? And then we can get into kind of how you work on these a bit more. But yeah, do you want to tell us a bit about some of these? Sure, yeah. So I do a fair amount of work on dinosaurs. Quite a oh, lot of my great. work comes in from the dinosaur collection because they tend to be, uh, well, they tend to be big bones stuck in rock. They take a lot of preparation. Uh, and we've got a decent dinosaur collection here. So I'm working quite a lot on this a uh, dinosaur we got in recently, a British dinosaur, um, probably something like Mantellosaurus, the, uh, one of the spiky thumb sort of iguanodon looking okay. dinosaurs. That's like the one that you can see in the main hall in the museum yes. if you visit, right? There's a beautiful mounted skeleton of Mantellosaurus in the main hall of the museum. Does it have any close relatives that people might know about? It's closely related to Iguanodon, which okay, is the bigger right. dinosaur with the, the spiky thumbs. Um, but yeah, that's from Britain. We've got a bit of Mantellosaurus material around here. Um, including a lovely part of a skull there. You might be able to see the lovely teeth there for oh, wow. grinding plants. Oh, um, yeah. Those are quite, are those quite pointy still. They're, they're still quite... Um, Can I touch it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> still quite rough, yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. And so this one would have eaten plants, so, so yeah. grinding up plants. And I was just um, working away... That's already been part prepared when I got it. I was just working away the, the um, rock from inside the skull to right. reveal the inner surface of the bones for the researchers who are interested in that part. Um, so we've got a fair amount of sauropod material here as well. Yeah. So the, this specimen here is, uh, is one of the um, vertebrae, one of the backbone pieces from a big, long-necked, plant-eating dinosaur oh, right. uh, from the Sahara Desert. Yeah. And if you feel the bumps on your back, that's the, the end of your neural arch up there. And oh, then wow, there's the big blocks that make up the, the spine. And then the hole there is for the, the um, spinal cord to go through. Right. Um, so that's huge. Yeah, it's, it's a big hole. dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> we're talking sort of the size of Dippy, that's all. Yeah, okay, massive. There. 
And this, th you've got some sort of covering on this one here. Yes. Why is this one covered? I talked about fossil prep as being just the removal of rock, but there's also other things I'll be doing. I'll be doing repairs, restoration, filling cracks, stabilizing any fragile bits. Uh, also uh, coming up with storage uh, solutions as well. So for a big heavy bone like this that's very fragile, the thing about fossils is they can be very heavy, very mm. large. They're not very good at supporting their own weight a lot of right. the time. So I make this sort of fiberglass resin jacket. Uh, I will sculpt it to fit exactly over the specimen. Yeah. And if I do a double-sided one, it's what we call a clamshell jacket. Yeah. Then it, uh, it's too heavy, but you can flip it, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can see either side without having to touch the specimen. You can. Yeah, that's amazing. It. And it's much easier to carry around, like, uh, supporting the weight evenly like amazing. this. Amazing. And what kind of bone is that in there? Fossil, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a fossilized bone. I think it's the ulna, so one of the lower limb bones from again a big sauropod. Right. Uh, from Morocco. Yeah, and then, yeah, you can kind of see that it gets really, really thin. And yeah, I can just imagine like this is literally rock and yeah. like having all that pressure on that middle part. This is this is an amazing way of keeping it all intact. Yeah, you can just imagine if you tried to pick it up there, it might just break down the middle. Oh, so. I don't want to know, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> oh, and we um, also do sort of uh, specialised boxes and okay, right. um, cutouts for... for to oh, do you want to grab specimens. one of those over there and I can, I can have... Can yeah, have just to, to show you how you can like, uh, carefully store a specimen yeah. Like that, nestled in its own little cutout. You see that there, look how amazing that is. It's all just really perfectly kind of nestled in there. So that's not going to get damaged while it's in the collection, right? Yeah. That's really cool. And what is this? Uh, that's here? the tooth of me a megalodon, a very big shark. Oh, right. Most people might be aware of. <laughs> <laughs> everyone and welcome back to Hidden Treasures. I'm really sorry there was a technical error, some sort of glitch, maybe dinosaurs chewed through our wires or something, but the main thing is that we're back and we're, in case you're just joining us on this version of the stream, um, we are with Kieran, uh, paleontologist and fossil preparator down in the museum's conservation lab and Kieran was about to just demo uh, some fossil preparation techniques, which is super exciting. Yeah. Do you want it, yeah, yeah. everything on? <laughs> yes, we've got some PPE too. And yeah, let's, let's turn it on and check this out. So I was just going to demonstrate the use of the air scribe, the uh, sort of pneumatic um, pen. Yes. Uh, just by holding it carefully in my glove to protect me from the vibration. Very good. And uh, working away some of the rock from around these dinosaur bones to right. reveal them a bit more. Excellent. So what exactly are you working on here? So this is more of the uh, sort of Mantellosaurus type dinosaur we have in the UK. Yeah. We collected quite recently. Uh, there's quite a lot of it. Uh, and it's really hard rock. So it's, it's taking a long time to prepare. Yeah. And how long have you been working on this then? Uh, <laughs> on and off for the last year or so. Um, so it's going to be at least another year probably before I'm done with it. Uh, wow. Hard to say. And uh, so I see that it looks like you're chipping away bits of rock. But the thing is the fossil is also made of rock. So how can you tell the difference? Right. So yeah, the, uh, if you're lucky, the fossilized bone will look quite different. Matrix, like you might have noticed in the Sahara dinosaur. Yeah. The bone was nice and paper white, the rock was very red. Right. So in that case, you've got a really good contrast. Sometimes you don't. And that can be the hardest part of the job is finding out what's bone and what's matrix. Yeah. Um, bone can look uh, shiny when it's wet. It can have a sort of honeycomb texture if it's broken. Um, so yeah, it looks for sort of inconsistencies, differences in composition or texture or appearance. Um, Rock tends to be quite uniform, right. same all the way through. Um, but I, certainly, I need to know a bit of anatomy to do this right. I need to know sort of roughly what I'm looking at, what shape I'm expecting it to be. Yeah. I can see there's a beautiful toe bone of a dinosaur coming yeah, out there. Yeah, that's huge. Probably some ribs, things like that. And you're, you're getting like properly in between these different bones. Is, is this so scientists can kind of study every side of the bone, like other paleontologists? Yeah, they're interested in what they call the gross morphology, the overall shapes and sizes of all the bones of the skeleton. So I've got to take out as much of that rock as I can, try and bring out every bone if I can. Right, got it. Wow, it looks like you, uh, it's a little bit tense even watching it, but I'm sure you're a, you're a pro at this. Well, <laughs> I'd like to be better. 
<laughs> Amazing. Well, yeah, right. that's um, one of our main techniques, is the yeah. MBS drive. Um, did you want to see another, another tool in there? I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> what else have you got? So I've touched briefly on the air abrasive, which yes. is uh, great for more sort of fine detail work. Um, and if I just push that. <laughs> So in here, we've got a, a slab that we collected recently. Um, a couple of years back, we went out to Wiltshire. Yeah. And uh, some fossil hunters have discovered an incredibly well-preserved Jurassic sea floor. And uh, there's these beautiful animals called crinoids. They're like uh, related to starfish. Yes. Some, some of them have got a stalk, almost like a flower. Yeah. And they wave their arms in the air, collecting food particles. So I'm using the aerobrader, which is like a, a shoots a blast of air and powder. And I'm just going to work away some of this uh, sort of mudstone or clay, whatever this is on top, to reveal more of these animals. And you can see they're really well preserved. Wow. The stream's just blasting away very fine, small amounts of the clay. And this is a, a very different, is this like a softer rock than the one you were working on before? Yes, yeah, much, much softer. So I'm using just, I'm just using sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. Oh, wow. To, to blast <laughs> away that, that, that clay very, very carefully. Yeah, you can really see that coming away as well quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite satisfying. But yeah. It's also, um, it's quite a difficult technique to master. Yeah. Uh, I've got quite a long way to go before I consider myself good at that. Um, and I know that you're constantly moving as well. It's very, very easy to damage a fossil using this stuff. You can blast it away by holding it down for half a second too long in the wrong area. Yeah. So. Um, and these yeah. are these are super super valuable fossils. These are like they could potentially be a one of a kind, couldn't they? Yeah, well, this is a really important discovery. The, the number of animals, the, how well preserved they are, the diversity of the fauna here, is looking like it might be the best site in the UK for echinoderms, this group of sea creatures that includes the starfish and the sea urchins, right. and the crinoids. So, so that's kind of what we're looking at here then. This whole slab is just filled with these echinoderms, right? Yeah, I don't know if you can see some of these, they're, they're all through the, 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 the block. Yeah. And hopefully once I wear away all this top section, there'll be lots and lots more to see. Um, there's quite a nice, nice one coming through in this little block there. You can see all the arms there, the feathery bits coming off of it. Oh yeah. Very, very beautiful. Really, really cool. Amazing. As you see, it's very, very easy to blast away too much rock with this. This one's a bit more delicate. You, you, you kind of, you, you're kind of a, a, a jack of all trades in here with all these different tools. You're a problem solver, yeah. creative solution solver <laughs> you need to know a bit of anatomy you need to know chemistry because i work with acids as well yeah if you're lucky the rock might be the right uh, composition you can actually dissolve it right with acid to reveal yeah. the fossils but yeah i need to know uh, a variety of things a bit of mechanical engineering a bit of all sorts uh, right so yeah jack of all trades is a good <laughs> description great okay let's have a look at something else i think sure um there's actually something right behind where we're standing which is huge right here yeah and what are we looking at here so as i said a lot of my work is for researchers so yes. people who want to study a specific part of the specimen they want to reveal the fossil so they can study it yeah uh, but also occasionally i work on specimens that are going to go on display uh, so these big amnites are going to go out into the museum gardens as part of a display uh, but the thing about amnites is you really want to see that nice coiled shape of those beautiful ribs and patterns on the shell uh, and as you can see it's at the moment, there's blocks of rock just covering this thing. So I'm going to do some very old school prep, hammer and chisel work <laughs> to work away some of this uh, rock, just like this, and just. <laughs> try and work away until I've got down to the level of the ammonite. OK, right. That's a huge ammonite. It's a big one, yeah. 150 kilograms at the moment, this block. But let's see if we can't make it lose some weight. Do you ever get a bit, um, we've actually had a question through in from Emma saying, obviously that fossils are quite delicate. Do you ever get nervous working on them? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're currently smashing away rock right exactly. now. Exactly, <laughs> my, my job is to break bits off of the, the specimens. It's yeah. extremely nerve wracking. Uh, the preparator is probably the most likely person to damage the specimen. Okay. They're, they're, <laughs> my tools, they might vibrate, they might be uh, caustic chemicals. Yeah. They might uh, put huge forces through the, through the specimens. Absolutely, yeah, I'm very worried about that. <laughs> it's something you've got to be a bit philosophical about. Uh, it's also uh, something that might even be a good thing at times. If the specimen breaks, 
uh, it might even reveal more information that might turn right. out the researchers really want to look inside the broken section of a fossil bone. Right, cool. So I, when I repair them, and I do repair them, uh, I use only reversible materials. I use adhesives and consolidants yeah. that you can just dissolve with a solvent. So if it turns out the researcher actually likes it broken, <laughs> yeah. you can just dissolve that <laughs> adhesive, look inside it, and then I can reattach it later. Excellent. Uh, but that's a great question. On that note, do you mind if I have a go? Absolutely. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, just trying to look for a nice a cleavage plane in the rock, somewhere you can uh, smash away. Yeah. To, uh, we're working away probably here to here. Okay, right. Somewhere so like you were there. kind of like you were kind of angling it up like this. That's right, yeah. And then just kind of perfect. And you see those pieces kind of coming away there as well. Yeah, it's quite a satisfying rock to, to break. <laughs> it is, yeah, that's for sure. Wow. And then you've got these huge kind of suction machines, don't you? Yeah, a lot of this <laughs> makes a lot of dust. Uh, and so if I was working on this for any length of time, I'd, I'd have this extractor on to take up that sort of chalky dust that's coming off. Great. Well, thank you so much for letting me have a go there. That was a a once in a lifetime experience, <laughs> thank you. Um, we are kind of coming to the end of the show, unfortunately. I do, I do want to say thank you to everyone who followed us over onto this separate stream uh, to kind of follow along with all the fossil prep. Uh, but before we kind of disband, I wanted to just get to the mystery specimen, yeah. which we had a look at at the start of the show. Um, so just as a reminder, it was this one right here. Can you reveal the identity of what we have here? Yes, yeah, so there was a, several very good guesses, including, I think, a correct one. Uh, this is part of the head shield, the frill of a triceratops. Oh, wow. So if you think of triceratops with that lovely big sort of frill yeah. flared out behind the back of its skull, uh, that's part of the frill, uh, one of the side sections that make up the frill. The real skull is all on display in the dinosaur gallery. Um, so you, you, you'll see the real skull up on, if you go to the dinosaur gallery, you can see the main skull is up there. Yeah. But the frill has been taken off and they put on a, a cast of oh. the frill. Because it, it's very, very heavy, but also very delicate, very fragile. Yeah. Uh, so they put on a, a fake frill on the specimen. Oh, wow. To fill it out. <laughs> and this is part of the real one. And you can see actually on this one, if I can get out. What we've got there is what we call the squamosal, the side part of the frill. Right, okay. And so that's what we're looking at right here then. Yeah. Amazing. That's fantastic. Well, well, well done to everyone <laughs> who correctly guessed that because we had lots of people talking about ceratopsians as well, which yeah. is, includes triceratops. It does, yeah. So yeah, lots of very, very accurate guesses. Um, so just before we wrap up, we've had some amazing questions in from those, of, those people who are still watching along. Uh, real quickly, Lily's asked, what's your favorite specimen in the lab? Oh, favorite <laughs> specimen in the lab. Uh, that's really tricky. Um, Right now, I've got to say, it's probably this uh, Sahara Desert sauropod. Yeah. Just I spent so much time working with it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I was working on this over a period of four years, and it's quite, become quite special to me. Nice. Uh, yeah. So probably this uh, chunk of sauropod from Niger in Africa. We had a good look at that one earlier. And then just another question. Um, how long would it take? Obviously, I, I'm a very good worker, but uh, yes. how long would it take for me to get the ammonite out of that rock? Oh, see, that's tough because uh, as I get closer to the ammonite itself, I'll become increasingly more careful and go increasingly slowly. Um, so it could take uh, a few months to, right. to, to work wow. on that. And just real quickly, Michael has asked, how heavy is that? Uh, at the <laughs> moment, it's 150 kilograms. Wow. Hopefully, it'll be less when I take down that block. But we've got a sort of overhead winch and pulley thing to hoist it up and around okay, if we need amazing. to move it. I love that we're just surrounded by all this kit. This is truly unlike any of the other areas we've looked around here yeah, in the it's museum. A, it's on a pneumatic table as well, so that can be raised and Amazing. Lowered. That's so cool. At one, okay, one final, final question. Someone has asked, how can they get into becoming a fossil preparator? That's an excellent question. It is quite a difficult thing to get okay. into. It's quite a niche role. Yeah. Um, so I would say, uh, Study paleontology, if you can. Uh, I've only got an undergraduate degree, though you don't need higher qualifications, really. It's not an academic researcher position. Um, so I've got an undergraduate degree in paleontology. That's the, all the basis I need, really. Um, but other than that, I'd say uh, volunteering is really the way to get in. Yeah. So if you know of a local museum or a place that has fossils and needs some prepared, find out if they've got a volunteer program. Find out if you can get some experience in the lab, because it's such a hands-on, practical mm. job. You can only learn it by doing it. Yeah. Uh, so if you've got an opportunity to try that, and it's a good idea to try it before, because some people might find that it turns out that's not what they're suited for, mm. really. They'd actually rather do curation, right. or research, you know, something a bit more, um, uh, something different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, 
so, lots yeah. of different roles people can get in museums and stuff. So yeah, making sure it's right for them. Yeah, because yeah. you have to have a lot of patience for this. And, yeah, uh, and it's uh, it's not something that a normal person <laughs> might, <laughs> might might consider uh, as a good job. I consider it the best job in the world. Yeah, but, uh, not everyone would agree with me. Well, thank you so much, Kieran. You're an incredible scientist, and the work you do obviously supports the museum immensely. So we can't thank you enough for letting us come down. You're here very welcome. Thank this you. It's been fun. Yeah, so um, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for on today's show. So thank you so much for joining us and also sticking with us through the technical issues. I can only apologize for those. We're super sorry about that happening. But do make sure that you tune in for the next episode of Hidden Treasures, which is happening on next Tuesday. So that's Tuesday the 2nd of May, same time, 12.30 p.m. British Summer Time, in which we'll be joining uh, curator John Ablett with the mollusk collection. So that includes some of the most weird and wonderful creatures in the animal kingdom today, including squid, snails, things with shells, those sorts of things. So make sure you tune in uh, and get your questions ready for all things mollusks. Um, but in the meantime, make sure you head to our socials, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Give us a follow and let us know what you think about Hidden Treasures, what you'd like to see in the next season, potentially. Um, or also feel free to leave a comment in the chat box or the comment section down below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you are subscribed and you hit the bell notification icon for our YouTube channel because we're putting out loads of great content that you'll want to keep up with. And if you missed any episodes of Hidden Treasures Series 2 or Series 1, they're all in a playlist on our YouTube channel. Uh, but that's about all we've got time for today. So thank you so much for joining me and Kieran, and I'll see you in the next show. Bye-bye.